Welcome to part 2 of week 3. So what is short-term synaptic plasticity? If a spike is sent off from a neuron and received at the postsynaptic neuron, it causes some effect. The effect can be described as a change in the synaptic conductance, which gives rise to a stimulating current. If we simplify the picture and say, essentially, at the dendrite, it's a passive membrane, we can write down the passive membrane equation and find that there's a change in the potential of the postsynaptic cell. An incoming spike causes a postsynaptic potential. You can measure this postsynaptic potential or you can measure the postsynaptic current. And what you find is it increases, goes through a maximum, and then decays back. Now, the strength of the synapse is related to the amplitude of this postsynaptic response. Importantly for the following, this strength is not fixed. Rather, it can change. Synapses can change their strength. Synapses are plastic. And this has been known for quite a long time. How can you see these changes of synaptic strength? Well, a famous protocol is to inject a sequence of short pulses into a presynaptic neuron so that this presynaptic neuron fires, for example, eight action potentials which travel along the dendrite, arrive at the synapse and cause a response measured in the postsynaptic cell. Now the first spike arrives here and it causes a big response. The second spike arrives, it causes a much smaller response. The third spike, fourth spike, all of the subsequent responses are weaker. The synapse becomes depressed. So this is a synapse with depressive behavior, a depressing synapse. Now, if we wait about 500 milliseconds and give another spike, then you see that the synapse has recovered. It's nearly back to its original value. The strength is nearly back to its original value. So, how could we model the observed effects of synaptic depression? As we have seen in part one of this week, Inside the presynaptic terminals, there are vesicles filled with neurotransmitter. Not all vesicles are in the state ready to use, in the state where they are already close to the membrane so that they can open upon the arrival of the signal and spill out the neurotransmitter. So, amongst the total number of vesicles that are around, some sit just inside the cell, useless, and a certain fraction is ready to use. And this fraction will be called PREL. Now in a steady state, uh, transmitter molecules are pushed back into the vesicles, Vesicles will, vesicles will dock on the membrane. So there's a steady state where a certain fraction, P0, of vesicles are ready to use. If there's a deviation from P0, it takes a time, tau P, to go back to the steady state. There's an exponential approach back to the steady state characterized by this time constant tau p. But now suppose a spike arrives. A spike arrives and this spike causes that the vesicles open and send out the molecules into the synaptic cleft. A certain fraction of these PREL, this fraction FD, will merge with the membrane and will be empty afterwards. Since they are empty afterwards, they are no longer ready to use. 
So normally, as a function of time, we are at a steady state, P0. Now a spike comes in at time Tk. And because of this spike, a certain fraction is used and then it takes some time to go back to the normal state. P rel is this momentary distance between zero and this curve. So this is P rel. If there's the next spike coming in here, then a fraction of the now available neurotransmitter vesicles will be used. So with each spike we go down, but we can never go below zero because of this multiplicative factor P rel. Now what's the use of P rel? Well, the total synaptic conductance will be determined by the amount of neurotransmitter that can be captured. But if less neurotransmitter is spilled out, less neurotransmitter is around. So the total synaptic conductance is limited by this factor P rel. And in a simple model of the synaptic conductance, we would just have an exponential pulse that's controlled by the amount of neurotransmitter that's around. So let's see how this model works. Here we have a sequence of four pulses. First pulse causes a synaptic response. Second pulse causes a reduced response. Third pulse, the response is reduced further. Fourth pulse, the response is nearly zero. And then it takes some time to recover the response back to the normal value. And this recovery time was set here to 400 milliseconds. Many synapses show depression, but some synapses also show facilitation. Facilitation is the inverse effect. With each spike, the response gets stronger. The first pulse that arrives causes a response of this size, the second pulse a stronger response, the third pulse an even stronger response, and so forth. And then it takes some time to recover back to the normal value in this model simulation. It was set to 200 milliseconds. The model is in fact analogous to the previous one. There's always a certain amount of vesicles in the state ready to use, ready to be released, and uh, there could be more ready to be released, and uh, with each spike, out of those that are not yet in the state ready to be released, a certain fraction is recruited, is moved, say, closer to the membrane, so that it can be re released at the next spike arrival. So this factor, 1 minus P rel, causes a saturation and it assures that P rel can never grow beyond its maximum value of 1. To summarize, synapses are not constant, they change all the time. Synapses show facilitation, they can get stronger, they show depression, they can get weaker. The model I've discussed here can be found in the book of Diane and Abbott. It's a simple model which treats facilitation and depression separately. There is a slightly more complicated model, but of the same structure, of the same type, by Markram, Sodix, Pavelcic, which allows to describe facilitation and dis depression within the same synapse because that's observed. Some synapses show both facilitation and depression. So with this, I would like to close our discussion of synapses. Please take some time to look at the quiz that we have prepared for you. And here's also some literature for synaptic facilitation, depression, and synaptic modeling.